alive so let's just see what happens will the aerial come up Hello guys and welcome back to the Volks Wizard channel. Today's video is episode 3 on the Mark II Golf GTI I bought just before Christmas. Episode 1 covered its purchase and collection while episode 2 was a full appraisal of its condition. In that video I said I was going to replace the nasty non-standard JVC head unit with the modern DAB version of the classic Blaupunkt Bremen and that's what we're going to fit today. This head unit retains all the period charm of the iconic 80s original but instead of playing cassettes you get USB connectivity, you get SD card slots, you get Bluetooth and of course you get DAB digital radio. We're also going to replace the faulty wing mounted aerial and because it's really hard to get a good original replacement we're going to go full OEM plus and fit a Hirschman electric aerial which was a very popular period accessory when these cars were new. But before we do that, let's go inside and do some unboxing. Okay, let's start off then by unboxing the things we're going to fit today, starting with the Blaupunkt Bremen SQR46 DAB. That's quite important because without that, I think it's just the old one from the 1980s. That's what it looks like, like it's from the 1980s, which is cool. Let's see what we've got in here. Okay, so at the top of the box, we've got some ISO leads. So these are basically designed to connect to the ones in your car if you haven't got these already and you have to sort of connect them with butt connectors. That's the power version there. And those eight, so four by two, yeah, is for the speakers. But the good news is my car has actually already got these fitted to work with the JVC because it's a standard size plug this. So chances are you'll already have this. Um, I think... I don't remember what the cars were like originally, but I think you may have to do some modifications. There's also which is the permanent live and which is the ignition live that can vary. So you might need to change that. You might find if you turn the stereo off, it forgets all the settings because it hasn't got a permanent live keeping the memory alive. Okay, so that's the plugs. Here we have the DAB aerial. So you stick this to your screen and it's pretty, I mean, it's not an awful lot to it, but it looks a bit incongruous on an old car or any car actually. So instead of fitting this, I bought this, which looks a lot bigger, admittedly, but it's black. And we can stick that on the back of the car where it's not as visible. It's got a three meter lead, this one, which this one probably isn't too far different. I'm in two minds about which to fit, but the fact that this is black, well, that looks sort of unfinished, might be the way to go. Right back into the Blaupunkt then, we need to get the unit out. And the first thing you notice if you've ever looked at an original single DIN stereo, especially one from the 90s, is that it's a lot shorter. So it's probably about two thirds of the depth of the original stereos. And that's good because there's not an awful lot of room behind them. So when you have things sticking out like aerial adapters and all these leads and um, phono connectors, you need more room. Okay, so on the back of here, we've got a USB rear one, which is, I'm gonna wire that up, put a lead into that and have that sticking out the dashboard somewhere so I can connect my phone to it. I don't really wanna put stuff in the front unless I have to. We've got SD card there, USB there, and an aux in there as well. What else we've got here, the external mic, that's for the Bluetooth, cause it's got Bluetooth built in. And this is for steering, steering. Don't know about that. Also on here is the aerial adapter. So that's what an aerial can fit to directly. But if you haven't got the kind of connector that will fit on there, this is the adapter. This is basically the old style aerial with a pin sticking out and that will adapt it to the newer style one. So that's all good. And then we've got the cage that the stereo sits in in the dashboard. So yeah, that looks pretty straightforward. But I'm so glad it's shorter because that just makes life so much easier. The number of times I've pushed stereos into dashboards and they want to come out. Um, we won't have that with this one. And so we've got one more thing in here. Oh yeah, this is a mic for the Bluetooth. So that has to go somewhere around the windscreen. It's nice and black and quite small, so that shouldn't be too obvious. And in here, wow, this definitely isn't 1989. We have a, an owner's manual operating instructions there in multiple languages. It's probably only a few pages and a remote control. I'm not really a big fan of stereo remote controls, but we've got it if you want it. So uh, yeah. Okay, next onto the aerial. This, this is quite important. It's pretty hard to get an aerial you can be confident will look like the original one. Um, they can be too bulky, they're universal ones. 
So I thought, well, why not go for an original sort of accessory? And Hirschman are a German um, car electronics company. I guess they do other stuff these days. They even have an aerial connector named after them. They're that sort of big in this sector. So uh, that's the box emptied. So we've got some instructions here, which is always good because there's quite a bit of wiring to deal with. We're going to have to take power to make it run. You're going to have to take power for when the car's turned off. So it retracts the aerial as well. That's going to be an interesting one. Uh, we've got a fuse in there. It's quite a few connectors and we've got the old style aerial. So that does need adapting to go into the back of the blower punct. And luckily the blower punct comes with the adapter. So that adapts that to the sort of newer style of aerial. Put that back before I lose it. I guess the most important thing with the telescopic aerial is that it's not just mounted in the, sorry, with the electronic aerial, it's not just mounted in the in the uh, wing, it has to be braced into the, somewhere in the body as well to keep it stable. So that's going to be a bit of, a bit technical, but we can do it. Uh, yeah, that's the grommets go into the body there and we'll take power off the back of the stereo. That's an earthly that will probably stay somewhere in the engine compartment. And that's what it looks like on top. Now it's a bit bulkier than the original one, but I think it's it'll be fine. And like I said, it's a period accessory and it's true to my policy of OEM+. We've also got a plastic bag here, which has got some of the fixings for the bracket. And we've also got a drain tube, just a little piece of plastic tube that slots on the bottom of there because presumably water can get, get in it and it's perfectly fine as long as it comes out again. Right, let's go out and fit all this to my Mark II Golf GTI. Okay, we're going to start by fitting the telescopic aerial. Obviously to do that we need to remove the old one. It's located inside the near side wing, so we need to jack the car up, take the wheel off, take the wheel arch liner off, and that should give us access to it. We'll also need to get it out of the area from behind the dashboard, but it might just pull through. So yeah, let's get, let's get stripping. Okay, so I've got the wheel off and now I've got access to the wheel arch liner and I just need to undo all the bolts holding it to the wing with this ratchet with an 8mm socket on the end of it. And they should just pop out now. There we go. Good opportunity to have a look at your inner wings. This was this has killed a lot of Mark One golfs in the past. Yeah, looks pretty good. I can also see inside the leading edge of the front wing as well. And it's a good time to get all the mud out. But we need to refix this arch trim because just like the other side it's not very secure uh, there is an original rivet there but it's pulled out because some of the wings missing from corrosion actually the rest the rest of it seems pretty good yeah yeah it's all there so that's another job for another day today we're just going to fit this aerial so let's just have a look inside here and see what we've got for some reason there is just a the remains of a cable there that looks like the remains of an old electric aerial, bizarrely. So here you can see the aerial connector there with the power leads. I'm laughing because it looks just like what I'm about to fit. And in there you can see the original aerial in the wing and its coaxial cable going into the inner wing, which then goes into the uh, interior of the car, then to the back of the, the stereo. So that's just a legacy from an old one that was never removed. So we can sort that out today. Okay, so I'm gripping the aerial body in the wing and holding it tight so I can undo it. the nut with a 15mm spanner. Obviously just be careful with the bodywork because you're working very close to it. Go back and now, uh, yep. Yeah. 
Okay, so just carefully get the gasket and the nut off. And then, there we go. Okay, we need to now try and feel our way into the dashboard and find out where that, that cable goes. This, by the way, is the inside of the car now without the stereo in place. As you can see, someone's gone to great extent to rewire the loom for the JVC that was in it, and this just happens to be perfect for the Blaupunks. This is the old original plug, I think, with some bits you don't really need left on it. All the important bits like power are on this bit and then speakers on the top. So it's basically the same as the one that comes with the car just in one unit that literally just plugs in the back of the Blaupunks. This, though, is the problem. So you can see there's been a bit of strain on the cable there and that's caused it to fail. So we just need to get this out. I think we need to get this section of the dash out. Okay, that's the lower dash off. What have we got in here then? It looks a bit wrong. Is that the aerial? The Another aerial. Okay, let's just follow this back into here. Yep. Okay. Well, actually, I could have replaced the end piece on this then. Looking, it looks like a connector in there, but in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay, that should shouldn't be too hard to pull through. Yep. It's the beauty of old cars. That bit isn't really that far away from this bit. Okay, let's follow this up here. There's this grommet we need to pop out. through now he says and there you have the old aerials so now we need to find out where this goes I'll just pull the earth cable off for now I think it'll go inside yeah, maybe. No, maybe we need to pull it through this way as well. So let's go and see what's going on inside. Okay, so I'm trying to find uh, the wires that have come through the bulkhead and where they go to. Okay, what I'm going to do is undo this connector, which means then all this loom can come out. I've got to get it out anyway, because I really don't want the old aerial to be um, staying in the car. So let's just pull that through. And then that should go into the engine bay. Okay, and that's the old loom out. We still have a mystery because that's two aerials we've taken out now and there's still one <laughs> here. What is this doing? <sighs> well guys, after a lot of struggling, I decided just to pull as hard as I could and this is what I found, a cut end that somehow was jammed on the top of the glove box, making it even harder to get the glove box out. Hopefully you can see that's quite corroded, so it's not just happened 
and it would make sense because this really has got no other place to go apart from into an aerial in the wing so presumably when the electric aerial was fitted this was just stashed there and <laughs> here it is today but this is definitely the original because it's wrapped in the anti-rattle foam as you can see it's perishing somewhat right now that's the car stripped we need to get fitting the new aerial okay i've got the aerial in position now it's quite interesting in that really there's not an awful lot of room in a mark II golf for a bulky aerial like this in the wing um there should be all sorts of brackets at the top of it there to allow you to adjust the angle of it but i haven't fitted them because there's no point you cannot adjust it any more than where it is now when it's resting alongside the inner wing so i'm going to put the bracket to take the weight of it and then basically this is just going to tighten against the bracket down here and it should be pretty secure then now because it's pretty tricky to um, get a drill into this section here what i'm going to do is bend this bracket round so i can try and drill in there let's give it a go we just need a little guide hole for the self-tapper. some wax into that hole Okay, that's in, and then we'll just tighten up the mounting to the bracket. Uh. Okay, that's looking good. That's pretty secure. Morning guys, it's a new day, and with a new day come new ideas. So when I fitted the aerial yesterday, I hadn't really fitted it properly. The universal bracket needed drilling of the wing, and I didn't really, really want to do that. So I put it in without that, and it seemed pretty secure. But being an electric aerial, it does go up and down with a motor and it really needs to be secure to stop this moving up and down in the wing instead of the sort of the mast. It seemed okay, but I had this better idea really. So I'm not, I didn't use the universal adapter, which you can sort of position it so it locates on a wing that's not flat, which this isn't. As you can see there, there's probably a few degrees in that wing. Instead of that, I've used this, which I don't need to drill the wing to use. It's a washer, although it did have a thread in it for some reason. I've just ground it down so that it's, when it goes in the wing, it's flat at the bottom. That's the key thing. You need to have that located sort of square 90 degree to the ground, and but flush in the wing. And that's what the adjustable bracket does. You just turn it so you get that position. Um, but hopefully that should sit quite nicely on there inside the wing. And then I can bolt the outer bit to it and it's all nice and secure. So yeah. I'm quite happy with that. Do you think the profile's pretty, pretty good? There's the wing. There's the washer. Next up, guys, this drain tube has to go onto the power antenna module. And because it's cold and they want a tight fit, it's almost impossible to get it on there securely. So I'm just going to heat it up with this heat gun. If you haven't got a heat gun, I would recommend you get one because they're just so useful. And now that's a bit more malleable. Okay, and that's now on really securely. So as that cools down, it will just take the shape of the, the module and yeah, stay on there forever. 
Okay, I've got my hand holding the aerial in the wing, but I just wanted to show you the washer that I've adjusted with the Dremel. You can see at the front, there's a little red dot. I put that there so I know which is the lowest point of it, and that should be facing out from the car. And it looks pretty snug in there now, so I just need to bolt the top pit on and then put the bracket back on at the bottom, and we can then move on to finishing off the wiring. Now, because we're using a solid piece of metal inside the wing, there's no room for the little tab that was on this external piece of rubber grommet to um, to locate, so I've cut that off. The beauty of that, though, is that it also means it can sit further inboard, because before it was slightly sticking out over the wing, and now it, you can position it, I think, pretty much perfectly on the wing. I think it will all be held in place by the nuts and washers that you put on anyway, so yeah, that should be... That should be pretty good. Okay, just doing the final tightening externally. It's a 17 mil spanner on this one. I think the original was 15. And you don't need to over tighten it, otherwise you will distort the wing. So the whole point of this adjustability is that when the aerial comes out the wing, it's horizontal, so in line basically with the scuttle. So you adjust this so it takes up the slope of the wing. I suppose it's quite clever, really. And yeah, it does seem to work, so that's nice and secure now. Just need to tighten up the bracket in there. Now while the dash was apart, I took the opportunity to repair the blower motor resistor pack, which I mentioned, I think, in the first video, because the fan was only working on on the maximum speed. The one and two speeds were, were through the resistor, and because the thermal fuse had blown, they weren't working. So it's better than nothing, but you know, one and two is quite nice, three is a bit fierce. So there's a thermal fuse, the shiny thing there, you cut the old one out and then you crimp the new one in place. Order them off eBay for about three quid, you get some crimps, make sure you get more than two because it's really easy to mess them up. You need to make sure that the fuse doesn't touch the other bits of wiring like where those plugs go in, otherwise you might have a short circuit. That's good, 184 degrees. If it blows again, I'll have to think about refurbishing the motor in there because that could be drawing too much current and causing it to overheat. Should we see if it works? The ignition is on. And this switch should work. Probably best not to leave it like that because it will just take off. Yay, speed one, speed two. And before it grinds its way through the lower dash, uh, we shall stop there. So yeah, job done. So in here now, in the head unit aperture of the two power leads from the antenna, that was really easy to feed them through a hole in the bulkhead behind this air box for the cabin and then you can put your hand in back there and pull them through. So they're here. The antenna is here as well, and it's only just long enough. I'm pretty sure that should be okay, but it's going to be pretty tight. There might be a bit of slack I can pull through. We'll worry about that later. What I need to do is work out where the permanent live is going to come from and the power from the radio. Now, as I said before, I think it had a power antenna in before, and this looks like it would have been used to power it up because... This was redundant on the JVC. And if you look it up in the Blypunk book, number five is auto antenna. Number five is two up from the bottom. So one up from the bottom of three across. If you position the plug in the same way, the blue and white one is one up from the bottom of three across. So that's definitely going to connect to the Blypunk's aerial feed. So that's good. Again, it's ISO standard. So every stereo should have this on the same pin. What's slightly confusing is that we also need a permanent live which they call the memory backup because it basically stores the memory settings. But we also need to feed that to the aerial. And you can see where I pulled the loom off. So this should be a permanent live, but I've checked it with a multimeter. It doesn't have any power. So I need to kind of work out what's going on with that. Well, guys, I didn't even need to get the lower dash off to find out why there's no power on the permanent live for the stereo. I followed the wiring behind the switches and I noticed it was actually factory wiring went into the factory loom so I thought well first thing to do is check the fuse box and found what the radio one was number 22 there 22 is the very last one almost behind the dash here pulled it out and lo and behold it's blown so hopefully with that we'll get live onto that red lead which will then supply the permanent live to the antenna Okay, the new fuse is in, so we're going to just make sure we've got the power using this multimeter. The earth we're using is off the stereo harness, and this is where we need to have power, so we'll just touch that on there. 
and there we have 12 volts so that's a result we just need to tidy this up a bit now so we can connect the aerial uh, the red cable which gives you the permanent live to the antenna which closes it down when the ignition and the radio are turned off okay it's getting even closer to the moment where we can get the aerial to go up so we've got both power leads connected to the wiring loom that's the one direct to the stereo this is the one from the fuse box the permanent live so i've tapped off the lead there actually on the stereo loom to go to the aerial so i melted a bit of the insulation away and soldered that on and then put some heat shrink over that that's a pretty good job i think i can disconnect it there when I want to wrap it with the loom tape. Likewise, I can disconnect there with the bullet connector to um, do that as well, so that's all good. Okay, I've gone for the 10 quid DAB aerial that I bought off eBay, it's the black one, and that's primarily because I think I'd rather have black plastic on the screen than the funny sort of circuit board that you stick to the screen with the supplied DAB aerial. Also, the windscreen will come out for the paintwork and it's easier to remove and reattach this because it's just got some double study tape holding it on. I love working on Mark IIs because they just come apart so easily. So easy to take the sun visor out, just uh, three screws and this uh, trim, one screw, and I think it just popped off. There's a spring there that keeps it in place. And then just running this cable basically down the A pillar and the little plug on the end should go behind, should go down there. Quite nicely that'll pop out under the dashboard and then sort of connect with the wiring from the aerial somewhere sort of down there so yeah let's um, get finishing that off okay so the mic is now in place i haven't stuck it to the screen yet because the screen's going to come out and it probably work okay just there i've run the cable over on the passenger side along with the dab aerial i've tried to get it behind the hooks for the sun visors but i couldn't get it behind this one because this seems to have been bonded to the bot the um the roof so i've run it behind the windscreen seal it pops out sort of just here and then cable tight together down there and then out by the blower motor under the carpet clip I'm sure you can see that i think it's behind the blower motor there it is run the cable under there and then it joins the aerial wiring there comes up over the um, air box and then you put your hand in and can plug it in the mic was actually quite short, but it's got a fly lead off the back of the radio to connect to, so that's actually fine. There's loads of um, cable for the DAB aerial. So as you can see, it's working on DAB now. Um, so that's pretty much all the installation done, just the tidying up to do, which I think I'll do tomorrow, seeing as it's kind of getting dark now. Well guys, welcome to day three of the Blackpunk Bremen SQR46 DAB install. I'm hiding from the rain in, in my porch because I'm wrapping the electric aerial loom with this fabric tape. I actually ordered some tester tape from eBay but it's just taking too long to come so I ordered this probably knockoff version of um, Amazon came next day, similar sort of price. It looks pretty good quality to me. The reason I'm doing this is because you don't tend to have exposed wires like this in the engine bay. They're usually wrapped in some loom tape so it looks more OEM. It's a bit more protective as well. Um, and it's just a few quid for this roll, which I can use elsewhere just to tidy up the old tape because it doesn't last forever. It's 31 years old and a bit tired in places. Actually, before I put everything back together, I've just noticed there's a bit of corrosion here on the top of the bulkhead. It looks like the water deflector that sits here has rubbed into the paint and that's very early stages of corrosion. The steel on these cars seems to be so good because it might start rusting, but it doesn't get, seem to get too serious. Anyway, rather than ignore it, what I'm going to do now is polish it down because it really is just a tiny little bit of it and that will show you the exposed metal i think the the actual water deflector on these cars is harder the early ones up to 1990 or up to 91 are a real flexible plastic and they wouldn't eat into paint like this but the later one which doesn't break does seem to be eating into the paint so if you've got a 91 with a hard water deflector then just go and check this because left unchecked it could be quite nasty what i'm going to do is polish as, as much away of it as possible and then give it a protective coat of wax which I'll show you now. Now the wax I'm using is Dynax UC by Built Hamber. I've used many other waxes on this channel in the last few years but this is the one everybody recommends so I've listened to you guys this time and this will be used on the car pretty much 
everywhere but maybe not today because it's a little bit wet and places could do with some cleaning so this is really just an emergency coat on a corroded area it does go happily onto corroded areas um, but you do have to apply a number of coats to get the best protection today i'm just going to give it a quick spray just one coat just really to seal up that surface you can drive it after 30 minutes they say and final firmness is in 24 to 96 hours so one day to four days i guess depending on temperature which uh, is a bit cold today so it's the first time i've used it let's just nice exactly what i want it to do just to be on that joint there in good time i'm going to protect this really crucial area which is where the scuttle the a pillar and the inner wing all meet because that can corrode it's killed quite a few mark twos this one thankfully he's pretty good up there so if you've got a mark two it's really a good idea to get your um, scuttle trim off i know they can break but it's a really good idea to just get it cleaned make sure all your drain holes are okay i've done a bit of vacuuming here just to get some muck out it wasn't too bad actually but uh yeah if you have water build up here there's a drain hole there into the wing then that can build up around the ECU and you can have a lot of trouble so uh, yeah it's worth taking it off periodically and as well as cleaning it doing this and I will cover up the chassis number these were um, not painted properly in the factory once they were stamped and they always corrode so it's a good idea to get some wax on there so make sure you can read it but yeah that's good we will come back to this in in the summer okay now with the exciting bit putting the head unit into the aperture and testing to see if everything works okay i've already put the frame into the dashboard and folded the tabs in so it's secure it's a really nice fit actually it fits the hole perfectly i've added something else here i've got my phone mounted on a mega mount these are pretty good phone mounts they're really cheap as well this was a black friday sale they're about they were half price which is like five pounds each and I've got one in my Cooper, I've got one in my Boxster. There's no way it was going to work on this car though, because if you look at the air vents, there's just no room for that to slot on. So I've had to cut another groove in at 90 degrees to the existing one, and now it fits perfectly. perfectly. I used my Dremel for that, it didn't take long at all. And there's a magnetic mount there. I've got a USB cable with lightning connector on the end of it, connecting my phone to here, and then this will go into the USB uh, out, um, fly lead on the back of the Bremen so let's just get plugging everything in then so first up let's do the mic which is this fly lead here that's for the Bluetooth and then we've got the DAB aerial another good thing about this head unit is that it's so much lighter than the old ones which means that you can hang it from its sort of cables and it's not doing any damage also if it swings around it's not really going to damage your, your dash very easily okay that's good one little problem is that as i suspected the aerial lead is just that little bit too short probably just an inch or two too short um so i can't connect that today also i've lost the adapter off the back of the head unit which is really really annoying but i can fix that problem when i get the extension bit for the aerial so we're not going to have fm aerial today but it'll still go up and down assuming it works we don't need to connect the steering wheel controls because we don't have those we do need to connect the USB but I think we'll do the main connector first so once this is all wired up correctly in it goes and then finally USB so this bigger connector and let's turn that around it's a little bit short up and that's it so let's just make sure everything is as tidy as possible but this is the best bit now about this stereo well apart from the fact it's like a modern functionality but the, a really cool thing is that it's just that little bit less deep which means you don't have to wrestle too hard with the cables like you probably have done in the past i know i have so that fits in there really nicely when it when they're deeper there's no room in the back of the dash and they're trying to come out at you and you don't know what you're doing to the cables and that's probably what killed the original aerial cable so before we push it in i'll just put these blanks back in before I lose them okay so that's all connected up and the ignition's off but it should still work without it because it's got a permanent life so let's just see what happens 
Will the aerial come up? Yes! How cool is that? Blimey, that is, that is a, quite a lot taller than the old one, so when it's connected, it could be quite a good signal, that. That's good. Will it go down as well, though? Oh, just push the head unit in. By the way, I didn't say in the unboxing. Just have to hold that down to turn it off. I forgot to say in the unboxing, in the bottom of the box are the tools to remove the head unit from the dash. So these little tabs, I think you pull out and they just slot in there. Okay, that's good. Now let's try it with the ignition on as if you were driving. So we left it with the radio off, so let's just turn it on again. By the way, you can change the colours, but this green that it comes with is pretty much perfect for Mark II. That comes on. And what you don't really want to do is have to turn the stereo off manually when you turn the ignition off and take the key out. If you turn the ignition off, it stays on. That's good. Take the key out. It's going off. That is brilliant. But there's lots of other stuff we need to change, check. So let's just turn it on, which we can do by turning... Actually, I'll turn it on manually just to save the car's battery. Now we've got some a BBC Radio 4 comedy on the USB output. Let's see if it will tune into that. It should know automatically. I think the early ones you had to choose a source, but this one will just go to the source. Yes. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm very busy, as I said. This is the men from the ministry. It's like a 1970s comedy about civil servants. It's hilarious. It's not on every, every week on Radio 4 Extra, but when it is, it really does cheer my day up. So yeah, that's automatically tuned into that. That's good. Let's try DAB now. Born in Bradford was presented by Winifred Robinson and it was produced by Susan Mitchell. That's pretty, pretty good quality radio for now. I can't play music in a video because I'll get in trouble with copyright stuff. Uh, I suppose we should try Bluetooth though. Okay, so that connection now is on Bluetooth and it's playing the men from the ministry yes, listen. just fine well guys thanks for watching this Volks wizard video it's simply an installation video today a full review of the blackpunk bremen sqr 46 dab will come in due course when i've lived with it for long enough to give a critical appraisal of it at this point there seem to be lots and lots of pros to it but if there are any cons rest assured i will let you know in that review video because this is a 100 percent non-sponsored video as ever guys keep commenting keep subscribing and i'll see you for the next one very soon